Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban signs an agreement with a top Chinese diplomat to strengthen Chinese investment in Hungary. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin has pulled Moscow from the last remaining nuclear arms control treaty between Russia and the United States. Wokesters in chief Harry and Meghan may be suing South Park for its hilarious We Want Privacy Tour spoof of the royal couple. And in the wake of all of these challenges to the United States, both foreign and domestic, sometimes we forget why we should defend America. So I answer this question, what has really made this country exceptional? I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. February 23rd, 2023, which makes it 022323. Please like, comment, and subscribe to this page. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. Now, as a reminder, tomorrow, that is Friday, February 24th, marks one year since Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and I'm going to be releasing a video talking about why Putin invaded the country. Sometimes we Americans fail to recognize these historical developments, and I think that they are so important for us to know, not only because they are interesting, but in order for us to see how Putin may behave in the future and how we, the United States, can appropriately react. So please look out for that video. On to other international relations story, China's top diplomat Wang Yi visited Budapest, Hungary this week, meeting with Prime Minister Viktor Orban. The two of them signed an agreement where China pledged to invest more in Hungary. Now, this is part of a week-long trip to Europe by Mr. Yi, this top Chinese diplomat. He is actually in Russia right now, meeting with Vladimir Putin. And many people think that in the coming days, and I suspect as soon as tomorrow, Russia and China may be announcing further strategic partnership agreements. Now, Mr. Yi was quoted in the wake of signing this agreement with Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. He said, when we have faced crises in recent years, Hungary has always come out of them stronger than it went into them. But Hungarian Chinese cooperation has played an absolutely indispensable role. It seems like quite an odd quote because Mr. Yi starts out by saying, when we have faced crises in recent years, which makes it seem like he's talking about China or his country, but then he switches to talking about Hungary. He says, Hungary has always come out on top of them stronger than it, than it went into them. So honestly, this just seems like BS. It seems like he is just trying to say a nice statement uh, to stroke Hungary's ego and to cement these further cooperation agreements. But it appears that Mr. Yi need not make uh, further entreaties to Hungarian diplomats, because if you look at the history of Hungary and China, their, their ties together, you see that they have had a lot of cooperation First, Chinese-Hungarian trade exceeds $10 billion. Also, Viktor Orban was the first European Union leader to, signed a, to sign excuse me, a Belt and Road Memorandum, which includes financing a railway line that connects Hungary to Serbia. Additionally, Hungary hosts Huawei's largest supply center outside of China. For those who don't know, don't know Huawei is a... Um, tech company in China that produces cell phones and has these big cell towers that host those cell phones. And Huawei has been banned inside the United States because unsurprisingly, China uses it to spy on users of the phones. This is exactly what China does with TikTok and with WeChat. TikTok has 80 million users in the United States. Its parent company, ByteDance, is a Beijing-backed corporation. And Joe Rogan actually recently on his show combed through TikTok's terms of service, its privacy agreement, and it was just stunning to see the kinds of things that people unknowingly agree to when they sign up for TikTok. TikTok 
gathers your personal data, your financial data, and then there are these weird stipulations that are put in there that TikTok can track your keyboard patterns, which essentially means that they can track what you type. Also, TikTok has a hold of your file names and contents of your files. So anyway, China uses Huawei to spy on citizens in a similar way that they use TikTok to spy on citizens, and Hungary hosts this company's largest supply center outside of China. And finally, in addition to this agreement, Hungary has agreed to host the first Chinese university inside the European Union. They are opening a Hungarian campus of China's Fudan University by 2025. So this agreement that they just signed this week, unfortunately, is just icing on the cake as far as Sino-Hungarian ties. This agreement also comes in the wake of several other Chinese agreements that, that China has signed with both Western and non-Western countries, even just this year in 2023, which we are not even fully two months into. For instance, in January of this year, China signed an agreement with, with uh, Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to bring more hydrogen energy development to Saudi Arabia and also to bring Huawei telephone towers to Saudi cities. Also, earlier this month in February, Xi Jinping signed an agreement with Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi. It includes a $12 billion transportation pact to build a railway line between Tehran and the northern Iranian city of Mossad. And this agreement also allows Russia, or excuse me, Chinese state-owned companies to spiff up Tehran's Imam Khomeini International Airport. Colombia, too, signed an agreement with China in recent weeks, and Colombian President Gustavo Petro is visiting China in the next month to discuss how Chinese companies are, guess what, building another railway line, this time in Bogota, to link it to other uh, areas in the country. And by the way, China has had a large influence in Latin America, specifically with building infrastructure projects and also providing Latin American countries with COVID-19 vaccines. Additionally, China has exercised a large domain in the continent of Africa, specifically in the Congo, Zambia, Ethiopia, Angola, Nigeria, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. I found this staggering statistic. Uh, I'm actually going to link it below in the description of this video. It's from the Foreign Policy Research Institute. And it says that since 2010, a third of Africa's power grid and infrastructure has been financed and constructed by Chinese state-owned companies. Yesterday on the program, I had this amazing woman, Reggie Littlejohn, on for an interview, and she is the founder of an organization called Women's Rights Without Borders, which sought to uh, save Chinese uh, baby girls from being victims of the one-child policy, which, by the way, was overturned in 2016, and now China exercises a three-child policy. And Reggie and I were talking about how baby girls are still victims of forced abortions and killings. It's just so sad to hear about, but Reggie and, and her, the people in her organization are such heroes. Anyway, I bring her up because one of the things that we were discussing in the interview is how much China has radically changed in its past few decades of history. And certainly, what I just said, the fact that, that China once had the one-child policy and now they've moved to the three-child policy and they're subsidizing uh, state IVF programs is one of the, the drastic transformations. Certainly another one is China's transformation from being very ideologically committed to communism to now allowing a capitalist economy. And finally, the biggest transformation, I would argue, and this pertains to this specific segment, is the way that China has transformed from a isolationist 
country to being a global hegemon. And one of the ways that they do this is by what I just outlined to you, by going into other countries, investing in those countries, and trying to assert domination and control. Because now China has these countries by the throat, so that when China misbehaves, the leaders of these countries cannot react. And we saw that on full display earlier this month when a second Chinese spy balloon traversed over Latin America. As a reminder, that first Chinese spy balloon traversed over North America, coming in over the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, going up towards Canada, and then re-entering United States airspace over Idaho and Montana, traversing uh, down and across the United States over the East Coast, and we shot it over South Carolina. But a second balloon, just a few days after that went over Latin America. And when the balloon, this is so interesting and revelatory, when the balloon was spotted by Costa Rican and Colombian authorities in the airspace of their countries, both of those leaders did not react. They came out with a statement and they said they acknowledged that they saw the balloon, but they dutifully repeated the Chinese storyline that this balloon was just for civilian research purposes. In fact, Colombian President Gustavo Petro came out and again dutifully repeated that story and said that the balloon did not pose a security risk to Colombia and thus they would not even consider shooting it down. Now, a large reason, in my view, why the Costa Rican government and the Colombian government were so mum on the matter is because China has invested in their countries and they have created a situation by their own design where they have, again, these leaders by the throat. So I'd like to ask you this question with regard to this Hungarian-Chinese uh, agreement. Do you think that China is just doing this to be nice? Do you think that China is just going, oh, yes, we love Hungarians, we love the country, we want to invest and build the infrastructure? Do you really think that's how they operate? And by the way, I didn't even mention China, in addition to going into these countries and industrializing, they have also purchased terminals at ports in various parts of the world in countries like Israel, Spain, Sri Lanka, Germany, and the United Arab Emirates. It's just yet another way that China is becoming a world hegemon and exercising control, not just politically, but economically. Now, a final note on this subject. It is disappointing to see Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban succumb to these Chinese entreaties and to acquiesce to their demands. Because one of the things that Viktor Orban has been known for in his country, at least domestically, has been trying to fend off or protect Hungary from unnecessary foreign influence. And principally, Viktor Orban has tried to resist unregulated immigration into Hungary. As a background on Mr. Orban, he is a right-wing five-term prime minister of Hungary. He served first from 1998 to 2002 and then from 2010 onwards, which means that he has been the prime minister for over half of Hungary's post-communist history. Hungary is a member of the European Union, and George Soros, the billionaire, likes to exercise a lot of dominion with regard to European Union countries, pressuring them to do certain woke things, including allowing a lot of immigrants to come into these European countries. Douglas Murray writes beautifully um, about the, the horrible immigration problem that Europe is facing. And Viktor Orban has been one of those few voices who has pushed back against the European Union, has pushed back against George Soros, and said that this unrest unrestricted migration into Hungary is undermining Hungarian language, culture, and tradition. So it seems a bit paradoxical and disappointing that Prime Minister Viktor Orban is so protective of his country in some ways pertaining to foreign influence, but then when it comes to China, Again, he's just allowing them to come right in. In other international relation news, now going back to Russia, Putin has announced that Russia will be withdrawing from the latest nuclear arms agreement between Russia and the United States. He announced this just two days ago in a, in a State of the Union TV address to his country. This specific treaty that he is pulling out of is the New START Treaty. Now, 
going back to the time of the Soviet Union, the United States and Russia have signed several treaties trying to limit or control each country's nuclear arsenal. But again, this one is called the New START Treaty. It was signed by the Obama administration in 2010. It was enacted in 2011 as a 10-year agreement. It was extended by the United States and the Russian Federation until 2026, but no longer because Putin is pulling out of it. This treaty established certain limits on the number of deployed intercontinental ballistic missiles that each respective country was allowed to have. It also put limits on the number of submarine launched ballistic missiles and nuclear warheads. The Secretary General of NATO, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, has said that unraveling this arms agreement is taking us into very dangerous territory because now essentially Russia can, can exercise or have control over its nuclear weapons in any way that it wants. And as a reminder, I said this on the show a few days ago, but it's worth reminding almost every day, Russia has the most nuclear warheads out of any country on Earth, including the United States. As of 2022, Russia had about 5,900 nuclear warheads compared to the United States, 5,400 nuclear warheads. Putin also said in this announcement that China would be testing new nuclear weapons if the United States decided to do so. This announcement is coming amid very high tensions surrounding tomorrow's one year mark of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As we all know, President Biden visited Kiev on Monday, which Putin said was a aggressive and provocatory move. President Biden is also in Poland right now where he has given speeches to our Western allies and our NATO allies about supporting the war in Ukraine. And recently he had this quote, which has been uh, heavily broadcast uh, in American news, where President Biden said, quote, Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. Never. Now, as much as I would love to think that that is true, and I would think all of us in the United States would like to think that is true, it seems that President Biden is a little bit over his skis here. If you look at all of the wars that the United States has been involved in in the past century or even half century, the Vietnam War was between 10 and 20 years long, between uh, or depending on where you mark it. The Iraq War was nine years long. Our conflict in Afghanistan that we only recently just pulled out of was 20 years long. So it seems a bit presumptuous and chest beating and overconfident, again, as much as I would hope to believe that it is true, for President Biden just one year into this Russia-Ukraine conflict to say that that Russia is never going to prevail. Also, there's an element here in this quote of not wanting to unnecessarily tease or provoke our enemy. I'm certainly not saying that we should be cowardly or stand down with regard to Russia, but we should be careful as opposed to cowardly. And I think kind of coming out with some of these statements may not be the best strategic move. Anyway, this is just to say that tensions are very high. President Biden visited Kiev. He's in Poland. He made the speech. He said this, this particularly provocative, hard-lined statement. Also, Iran just pledged 6,000 more drones to Russia. They are also building a drone factory in mainland, mainland excuse me, Russia. And finally, as I indicated in the first story, a Chinese diplomat is now in Moscow meeting with Putin. And as I indicated earlier, it seems likely that they are going to announce a new strategic part partnership agreement that will, that will only strengthen the ties between the two countries. And we know that Xi Jinping, the president of China, he himself is going to be visiting Moscow in the next few weeks. Now on to a little bit of lighter news. Harry and Meghan, and you notice that I am not calling them Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan because they have so trashed the royal family that I don't think it's appropriate to still call them by royal titles. Anyway, Harry and Meghan may be suing South Park for the show's hilarious spiff on the couple. Let's watch some of the clips before we talk more about the lawsuit. He's right. Trying to make ourselves into a brand just turned us into products. 
We don't need to be a brand, do we? If it's truly what we want, then we really can get away from it all. No more magazines and Netflix shows. We really can live a normal life. Yes, I'm sure you agree, darling. We can be the people we talked about being, with no more worries about how we look or the image we project to people. What matters is what we have on the inside. I love that. I also love this next clip that we're going to play, which is called the We Want Privacy Tour clip. It's so funny. Let's play it. Down with the motor hat. We deserve our privacy. These people. Why are we so mad today? Because we want our privacy. Park County Police Station, what's your emergency? Yeah, the neighbors across the street are setting off fireworks and it's 10.30 at night. Oh, is it the Prince of Canada and his wife who just want to be left alone? Yes, they're being super loud and I'm trying to work on my brand. <laughs> now the Prince is playing polo on the lawn. <laughs> we are here because privacy is a basic human right. How many more princes and his wives have to live in this nightmare? Can you two f keep it down? Hey, right. you ever heard of a thing called privacy? Yeah, nobody gives a shit. You two just shut up and go away. I love the pompous British sounding voice that they give Harry. I think that this lawsuit that may be happening, by the way, Harry and Meghan have not come out uh, themselves and said that they may be suing South Park. This is according to very reputable royal sources and sources close to the couple who say that this may be the case. But my speculation is, is that it is all bark and no bite. In fact, a spokesperson for the couple came out and called this South Park episode, quote, baseless and boring. I would like to respectfully disagree. I think it is totally baseful, if that is even a word. In other words, it is totally legitimate the way that they are lampooning this couple, and it's hilarious. They take everything so seriously, these people. Before we move on, I encountered this comedian on Instagram. Actually, my mother sent it to me because she is a fellow Anglophile and disliker of Harry and Meghan. This comedian does such a funny impression of Harry and he pretends to be Harry talking to Harry's therapist. And by the way, before I play the clip, some of you may have seen this on Candace Owen's show. I promise you, I did not get it from there. I found it independently of her, but anyway, she did play on her show. It seems that we have similar tastes in comedians. Let's play the video. You said there was actually an incident with the children? What happened with the kids, Harry? There was one Sunday where Emma and I were with my brother and his wife, <laughs> and they were taking the children to the park. They let the children play all day, but then they were like, let's go, it's getting dark. It was problematic. It was getting dark, the kids gotta go home. They clearly had a problem with darkness. Oh. It was obviously a digger M. It was deeply hurtful to see that even at a young age, they were instilling unconscious bias in the children. <laughs> Kids usually have to go home when it's getting dark, Harry. Well, then why do they let them play during the day? Would you let your children stay up and go out late at night in the dark? I would, yes. Oh, Jesus. Anything to combat unconscious bias. <sighs> That's what we're doing in my family, combating being afraid of things that are darker. Harry, there's daytime and there's nighttime. That's just the natural environment. Exactly. Oh. Part of it's racially motivated. I believe that. Because the night is darker than day, and my family certainly has a problem with that. Mm. And in the final segment of today, I would like to talk to you about American exceptionalism, which may seem like a total 180 from the, the previous subjects that I was discussing on the show. But really, actually, the previous subjects inspired me to do this final one. If you look at what I have talked about today, Hungary's agreement with China, Russia pulling out of the nuclear arms treaty between Russia and the United States, Harry and Meghan, you know, wanting to sue perhaps South Park for lampooning them. 
The through line of all of this is actually disdain for America and Western civilization. Our principal uh, adversaries are becoming closer to one another. They are exercising more and more dominion and um, control over other parts of the world. Harry and Meghan, yes, they are known primarily for trashing the royal family, but they have also talked about the terrible, supposedly uh, rampant systemic racism in the United States. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, I believe it was actually at the end of last year in December, they received an award here in the States in New York City for fighting systemic racism. And it just seems that as I comb through and report on the news every day, everything again kind of has this through line of disdain for America. So I firmly believe that it is incumbent on all of us now more than ever to fully appreciate and understand and be able to discuss what has made America so exceptional and why our country is worth fighting for. Before I get into four specific uh, bullet points, if you will, that I, I'd like to, to share with you on this point of American exceptionalism, I'd like to say that we really, we as Americans need to get sharper and stronger in our debating skills. This segment was also inspired by a debate that I had at the end of college, just under uh, a year ago, with someone who, uh, is an American, but was saying that she does not think that America is exceptional. And of course, you know which side of the argument I was on. I was arguing that we are indeed exceptional. But I found that I could not be as specific as I wanted to in my arguments. I would say, well, look at the rights that we confer upon our citizens, our freedom of speech, freedom of religion. And this girl with whom I was having the debate would respond, well, European countries have that or Australia has that, or New Zealand has that. In other words, anything that I would bring up, she would point to another Western or democratic country and say that they do the same thing. And so it forced me to get, again, more specific in my claims. And I have really spent some time trying to do research and picking, plucking out what are these specific things that have made our country exceptional. And I would like to share them with you because as a host, I really want to arm you with facts that you can pull out in a debate or a discussion or a uh, dinner party fight with your leftist relative. And again, mo now more than ever, it is so important for us to understand these things. The first thing that I would like to share with you is that America, more than any other country on earth, has allowed its citizens to have tremendous upward mobility. This goes back to our history, dating back to the 13 colonies, when settlers got on these boats, sailed across the Atlantic, and came to North America, where there was a lot of land, which allowed these individual settlers to become landowners to buy big plots of land and own, own and tend to that land. This stands in stark contrast to the situation that existed and to a large extent continues to exist in Europe where there is a small class of aristocratic landowners who get their land from their forefathers and pass their land along to their offspring. It was really unique that so many people from different socioeconomic backgrounds could own land in the American colonies. Now, of course, not everyone could own land. I'm not saying that this was unanimous or that we were always perfect at this, but we have to compare our country and our conduct to other countries in their conducts because human nature is bad. It has always been bad and it always will be bad. No country, no people will be or has ever been perfect. But again, compared to other countries, we have done an, it, just a remarkable job at allowing our people to have upward mobility. Even again, going back to the 13 colonies, if you look at the institution of indentured servitude, that was unique in and of itself. Of course, any, any type of servitude is abhorrent. However, what distinguished America is that our indentured servants came here and they served for about four to seven years. But when their time was up as being indentured servants, 
they were allowed to become voters and property owning individuals. This is so different from what existed in Europe, where if you were an indentured servant, you were an indentured servant for life. And finally, on this subject, another thing that is allowed for tremendous upward mobility in the United States is something that actually Alexis de Tocqueville, who is a French writer who came to the United States in the 19th century and wrote a very long book called Democracy in America, great book, by the way, about his thoughts. It's, it's something that he identifies about American culture. And it's that we, again, compared to other places and times on Earth, attach a lot of honor to any kind of occupation that people partake in. In the United States, you can be a janitor, you can be a street sweeper, you can be a floor mopper, just, just about anything. And there is honor and dignity to your work. That is not the case in many of these other countries who the woman with whom I was debating say are just as good as the United States. There is still, and there has been for a long time, a lingering aristocratic culture where certain professions, primarily what people consider to be quote unquote high class white collar professions, those are the ones that are consider, considered honorable and dignified and then other professions are not so much. That is not the case in the United States. The second point that I would like to present to you today is that the U.S. has been so unique in allowing religious pluralism from the very start of our nation. Again, we were not always perfect at this. The Salem Witch Trials, which I'm going to talk about in just a few moments, is an example. But if you look back at the 13 colonies, Maryland was Catholic, Massachusetts was Puritan, Pennsylvania was Quaker, Rhode Island was founded by uh, Roger Williams, who was an antinomian who lived in Massachusetts, didn't want to be under the jurisdiction of the Puritans, and went down to Rhode Island and founded his own religiously pluralistic state. That's amazing that we had these different colonies that were, that were sort of hubs of these different sects of Christianity where people could go and exercise what religion they wanted to. And it allowed people to kind of find their own tribe, if you will. And by the way, this is mir mirrored later in our federalist system, system that we have today of states' rights. States right now are sort of in individual hubs of ingenuity. Certainly we are all bound by the Constitution and by federal laws. But the fact that state law can differ really allows for a lot of diversity not just in the populace, but also in thought. For instance, Massachusetts was the first country, was the first state, excuse me, to legalize gay marriage in the country. And once we saw that Massachusetts did that, and it didn't turn out to be a disaster, and it actually turned out to be a good thing, that sort of paved the way for gay marriage to become legal at a federal level. All of these states' rights systems that we benefit from go back to this division early on in the 13 colonies that specifically allowed for a lot of religious pluralism and diversity. Thomas Jefferson, as early as 1776, also penned the Virginia Statute, which allows for religious freedom. He famously said, it neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg, whether you are Muslim or Jewish or a different sect of Christianity than I or Hindu or Buddhist. He again, showed a lot of forward thinking for being a man of that time. Now, of course, as I mentioned, we were not always religiously tolerant. The Salem witch trials where Puritans hung people who they thought were practicing witchcraft is an ugly stain on our history. But what Paul Johnson argues in his book, The History of the American People, which is just remarkable, by the way, Paul Johnson recently died, unfortunately, he says that what, what makes America unique in the Salem witch trial in incident and in, in subsequent incidents is that for all of our wrongs, we have almost always tried to rectify them. And what happened in the summer of 1692 is a very apt example. Yes, that one summer was terrible, egregious, and just, just savage, really. 
but it was confined to that one summer. And after the summer of 1692, the families of the victims were paid reparations. The people who oversaw the Salem witch trials were removed from their post and appropriately disciplined. And the United States has time and time again demonstrated wanting to rectify their wrongs and improve our on our mistakes. So the first is this tremendous upward mobility that America allows. The second is our religious pluralism. And third, I would like to say, is our Bill of Rights one of the things that has made this country so exceptional. The way that our Bill of Rights is written is very unique because it specifically says what the government cannot do to you. This is different from other countries' bills of rights. The wording is different. For instance, in the German constitution or bill of rights, I can't remember which one it, it was, but in, in a German constitutional document, it says, quote, freedom of speech must be respected. Now you would think that there's no difference between the way that our First Amendment is worded, where it says that Congress shall not make any law that abridges citizens' freedom of speech. You would think there's no difference between that and freedom of speech must be respected, that essentially they say the same things, but that is not so. The founders of our country were brilliant in understanding that the wording needed to specifically bar the government from infringing on certain rights. That leaves no gray area. If, if the people follow it and if the Supreme Court follows it, and it's debatable as to whether we have in, in recent decades, but if you follow the Bill of Rights, there is no gray area that the government cannot suspend your freedom of speech. With the German wording, freedom of speech must be respected, that is not as explicit and it leaves it more open for people to define what is freedom of speech. Maybe someone could say the way you respect freedom of speech is to prevent hate speech from being spoken. So our wording in our Bill of Rights is just extraordinary. Our Constitution itself is also brilliantly worded, among other things, because of the Supremacy Clause, which says that the Constitution takes precedent over federal and state law. In other words, that federal and state law must be beholden to the statutes and the uh, values espoused in the Constitution. This is very different from other systems around the world. Even if you look at the British system, the, the Brits have a Bill of Rights. They have the Magna Carta, which was written in the 13th century, which essentially functions-ish as a constitution, more as sort of a, a list of values. But in Britain, any new statute is inherently constitutional because Britain follows a system of precedent where the latest law is just the law and the precedent that one has to build up towards. And again, this is what makes our system so different because assuming that the Supreme Court is doing its job and our legislatures are doing their job, a law can only be a law if it fits into the framework outlined in the Constitution. And if it doesn't, hypothetically, again, if people are doing their jobs, it should be struck down. This is different, very different from other countries, including the one that we broke away from. And finally, point number four of the, the day, again, to arm you with facts, to put in your arsenal that you can bring up in a debate. This one isn't so much an argument about the design of our country as the previous three have been, but about our conduct. The way that we treat our enemies really puts us apart compared to other countries. The most principal, I should say, the principal example of that is in World War II. In the aftermath of World War II, Germany and Japan behaved so brutally, they were so evil and savage, we, the United States, could have very well imposed a Carthaginian peace upon them. Now that term, a Carthaginian peace, goes back to uh, a battle between Rome and Carthage, and that this is what Rome did to Carthage after the Third Punic War, where they put uh, salt in the soil, they destroyed the, the city of Carthage. And it essentially, this term, Carthaginian peace, means that you completely destroy your enemy. We, the United States, could have done that to Germany and Japan, but we did not. With Germany, we allocated millions of dollars in funds to help rebuild the country through the Marshall Plan. We allowed Germany to join NATO. We helped them draft a new constitution, rearm, reindustrialize. Similarly, with Japan, though, 
I recognize that it's a bit different because we did drop nuclear bombs on Japan, which in turn does give us an added moral responsibility to help them rebuild. But still, a lot of countries do a lot of terrible things to their adversaries and feel no responsibility to rebuild, but the United States was different. Douglas MacArthur, who is called the American Caesar, went into Japan, helped them remake their constitution, made the emperor a ceremonial post, gave women equal rights, among other things. And even if you go beyond World War II and look at the aftermath of the Vietnam War, we were done with the Vietnam War in 1975. We had this agreement with Vietnam, we were withdrawing our troops and sending them back home. But there were these Vietnamese boat people who uh, went on boats and tried to escape Vietnam after Vietnam was put under the control of the communists when the Americans withdrew. And do you know what the United States did? We could have very well said, we're done, we're out, it's not our problem, they have to you know, deal with their situation. But we Americans sent in planes and big ships to help these Vietnamese boat people, who by the way, many of whom drowned because the ships were these shoddy ships, they capsized. Many of them were taken, taken over and looted by pirates on the sea. And we Americans went and rescued these Vietnamese boat people. Again, have we been perfect throughout our history to our enemies? No. And many times have we needed morally to help them? Did we have a higher moral responsibility? Of course. But again, it's all about looking at what the United States did differently compared to other countries. And there is no doubt that we, time and time again, have been ahead, not just in our system, but in our conduct. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed it. And remember that each of our thoughts, choices, and actions shape who we are. So let's think clearly, choose wisely, and act with principle and determination. Take care.